What's happening, everybody? My name is Matt Monsveen, and you are on air with Radio Chatter. Joining us on the flight deck this evening, who are you? I'm Max O'Hone. I'm an underwater camera operator. Um, I mostly work on wildlife documentary series. Uh, lately, I've been working on Netflix, Disney, Apple TV, History TV, IMAX, a whole bunch of really exciting projects on the go. Um, but yeah, my specialty is underwater and cold water. Cold water. Cold water. Yeah, I don't know why I picked that. (laughs) It's pretty cold outside the airplane right now, too. So, like, both extreme ends of the the spectrum. But here we are at 9,000 feet. We are over Strathcona Park right now. Maxwell, thanks so much for joining us. And let's, let's dive right in. Um, I'm going to start with a confession, uh, which is the thought of diving actually makes me a little bit scared, which I know is probably a bit ironic because here we are at 10,000 feet in a small airplane, which is uh, the other thing that people are probably the most commonly afraid of. This isn't a diving talk show, so a lot of the people that are watching are are probably not as uh, knowledgeable on diving as uh, other podcasts that you've been on in the past. So um, low-hanging fruit here for you, Maxwell. Walk us through how safe diving is. <laughs> oh, I mean, humans aren't meant to, to breathe underwater. It's it's completely unnatural. Yeah. So, you know, over the years, diving has got a lot safer. Um, technology has developed and grown, and diving is, is pretty safe these days with the right training, of course. Of course, yeah. So, uh, I mean... The, the the scary thing with diving is when you're on the surface and you're looking down into the ocean, it looks dark and cold and, and spooky. But it's completely different once you get underwater and you're looking up towards the surface. Your, your perspective completely will change. There's a lot that happens underneath the surface. I think it's in the airplane too. Like you look up at the sky and you're like, oh my goodness, you're so high up. Like what goes on up there? But once you're here, you're like, okay, I, it's it's pretty steady. It's kind of stable. So you can kind of think about it a little bit more and uh, maybe catch your breath on some stuff. So I don't know. I always encourage people that are scared of flying to like go on an airplane. So I imagine it's probably similar with diving. If you're like hey, you're scared of underwater, then maybe if you went down there, you would feel a little bit differently about it. Exactly. Yeah. I think that diving is probably similar, I suspect, uh, to flying in the sense that um, when you go driving um, in a car, we don't we don't really think twice about it. Like we kind of just hop in and go. And um, you know, if the engine dies or a tire pops or something like that, you just kind of pull over and you call your friend and like it's all good. Um, and it that's not really how flying works though. Um, so you know, if anything happens up here, it's a little there's a, there's a lot more stuff that you're going to need to do to make sure that um, you you have a safe outcome for that. Um, and so I guess. I, I'm not sure really if that's how diving works, but there's kind of inherent risks uh, with flying. So we, 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 we do a lot of training and, and, and we match like mitigating strategies to what those risks are going to be. Um, and so I guess like what kind of events do you train for and how do you mitigate the risks uh, in, in a diving context? Yeah. So I mean, with, with diving, the, the number one thing is your air. Yeah. You don't want to run out of air. So you're constantly monitoring your gauges just like you would in an airplane. You know, you're monitoring the fuel. fuel. You're, um, you've got a lot more things to monitor in an airplane than you do underwater. Underwater, your you know air, your decompression. So uh, water has weight, therefore it exerts pressure. So every 33 feet you go down in the water, you're in another atmosphere of, of pressure. Really? Yeah. Holy smokes! It's not a lot at all. No. 33 feet. No. So so like let's say if you were to go down and take a breath down at at 33 feet but you're in two atmospheres of pressure, it's going to take twice the amount of air volume to, to fill your lungs. So, wow. So you're taking on two times more nitrogen than you would normally. So the deeper you go, the, the more nitrogen you intake, and your your body, you know, uh, it doesn't use nitrogen. And nitrogen, in order for it to come out, you need, you need time. So, so, so coming up nice and slow, letting that gas come out of your body, but if you come up real fast, then the nitrogen forms uh, little bu- uh, bubbles and it can get into your bloodstream and into your, your arteries. And that's where problems can occur. But everyone wears a dive computer and it monitors um, how much nitrogen you've been exposed to and, and how long you can stay at certain depths for a certain amount of times. Right. And, and okay. And, like, I'm, I'm trying to relate that back to flying because the, the amount of pressure, it doesn't change, like, that much. With like thirty three feet, it's not going to make a difference. Like in the air, um, do you measure inches of mercury, by the way, or what, what's the measurement? Uh, like in atmospheres. In ap- yeah, in atmospheres, it's yeah. so there's um, there's this little like wheel on here. Yeah. 
Um, that's uh, 29.8 or 29.9 inches of mercury. And the inches of mercury are on like a barometer, which is uh, tied to like atmospheric pressure. Oh, okay. So that's that's interesting. I, I figured like maybe that they would use inches of mercury, but is it millibars or 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 like? Yeah, millibars. Yeah. Okay. Right. That that makes sense. So um, it, it probably yeah changes a lot more underwater. So okay, I'm hearing like bubbles is one of them for nitrogen, and then air are like kind of the biggest ones that you're you're mainly spending the most of your time thinking about. Yeah, so I mean, in, in air, there's there's two mixes. You've got uh, oxygen, which is 21%, and nitrogen, which is 79%. Um, we just round nitrogen up to 79, but uh, there's also you know other little gases in there. But uh, yeah, with diving, we we have to take those into consideration for given depths. Um, and if you want to stay, like let's say, go down to 100 feet and stay a bit longer than just breathing on normal air you'd add a certain amount of oxygen, making a nitrox mix to that. Oh, okay. So this right. is where, like, it, it starts to get a little bit complicated. And, like, mathematical. Yeah, but it's, like, real basic with Dalton's Law. And, and yeah, it, it, it's just, like, a, a pretty much a, a few days of training to figure it out. Right. That's super sick. Um, I guess, do any, do any experiences come to mind where you really had to use your training in a moment of, like, elevated pressure? Yeah, I mean, there's 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 so many things that can happen when you when you enter the water. I mean, you've got all these different things that are affecting your your dive, whether it's current, uh, whether it's visibility, swell, surge, uh, all, all these things you got to take into a factor. Yeah, wildlife, marine life, boat traffic, um, an octopus eating your GoPro, octopus taking your camera into his den and, and not giving it back. Yeah. <laughs> something that can happen it's pretty badass if i give you a lesson on flying maybe you can give me a lesson on diving one day <laughs> yeah i think that's a good exchange i do that for sure your your career is like really really unique i i think it's really cool and i'm a big fan of when you can create overlap between your passions um and i think that that combination creates such a amazing way to interact with the world where like you have these opportunities that no one else really has um and so i think you're a great example of somebody who's done that um, because you, you kind of embrace this overlapping, I don't know, it, it, between diving and, um, and filmmaking, I think it's probably safe to say that you, those would be like two of your biggest passions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like grow, growing up, uh, I wanted to go to film school. That's what I was uh, aim, aiming to do. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess like you, you leaned into diving at age 17. Um, and, and did you just say like, because you wanted to go to film school and then you were like, I know we were talking about it on the ground a little bit, but you wanted to go to film school and you're like, okay, actually I, I, I found diving and I really like what I'm doing. So you, you, you ended up traveling the world and diving a lot longer than you were probably planning on at the time. Um, and so did you always like plan to reintegrate film into the diving at some point in the future? Or yeah. does that happen like kind of by coincidence? Or how did that, how did the, the two like find each other again? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. I mean, film, was what I was going to go to school for. I, I got some scholarships and bursaries to go to the Art Institute in Vancouver to, to go to film school. Um, but I had two months to kill before the program started. Right. And of course, I'm fresh out of high school, 17. I grew up in Pender Harbor on Sunshine Coast. It's a town population, 2000. Right. I was very excited to, to, to go and, and do a little bit of traveling. I'd, I'd save some money. Um, I used to work as a commercial fisherman, so I had a bit of money in the bank. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm just going to go to Central America and, and go there for two months before the course starts. And, and then, you know, it'd be kind of a, a little present to myself for finishing high school, go, go to the Caribbean. And, and uh, I took my open water course and I just fell in love with the lifestyle. My instructor was this tall Kiwi guy named Orlando, you know, beach blonde, tall. All the girls loved him. Guys would buy him drinks at the bar. Nice. And I, and I was like, man, like, how do you get this job? This is, this is so cool. And he's like, you know, you, you can just stay here and, and work with me if you want. That's <laughs> like, you know what? That that sounds like a like a pretty good idea. You know what? Maybe I'll I'll put off school for for a year or so. Um, so I called my folks back home. I told them that you know I, I'm I'm thinking of staying down in, in Honduras. Is on this little island called Utila. I'm gonna stay down there for for a bit longer. Um, I got a job as a bartender, 17, like serving pina coladas at this little dockside bar. Yep doing my dive courses uh during the day and it was it was just paradise yeah renting out like this little little hut on the beach for 200 bucks a month like a month yeah oh my god couldn't go wrong 
doing my dive courses. And um, yeah, I, I decided to put off film school for, for a bit longer. Um, but I ended up, you know, having that those scholarships and bursaries still kind of kind of floating in the in the background there. So I wrote letters to the uh, the companies that, that gave me those and said like, look, I'm I'm looking at becoming a dive instructor, um, kind of changing my my career path for now. But what do you think about if I could use that money for becoming a dive instructor? And they wrote back like saying, yeah, no problem. Like, really? Here's the money. So I was like. I just got yeah this this cash to, to to become a dive instructor and got some new dive gear uh, with it and yeah I, I ended up staying in Honduras for about a year and a half. My my parents eventually came down to visit and on the little island of Utila, you there there are no like proper vehicles. It's just like golf carts and mopeds and, and, yeah. and bikes. So I picked them up from the airport in like a little golf cart and, and my my parents' eyes were just like wide open like oh my god this is this is so cool. My my dad's like, yeah, you should just you know keep keep doing this while you can because it's it's <laughs> it's it's great. They just were so supportive and happy that I was you know living out of passion and and that uh, you know two months that I was supposed to be in the Caribbean turned into eight years. I I, I just went traveled um, country to country working in different dive shops and resorts, and working on private yachts, kind of all, all throughout the world it's uh you know i look back at now like all the places i lived and got to dive and it just it doesn't sound believable it's it's pretty crazy crazy it's such it's such a cool story and and i i, I didn't know that you um that you took you asked the people that gave you the bursary for for film school to to give you the money for diving like it's i I wouldn't have even thought to do that, but that's such a really like that's such a smart way of doing it. And obviously, like they, the, what they invested in you ended up going a really like long distance, and it, and it returned to the filmmaking community as well because you, here you are making films um, and and winning all sorts of awards and getting shots that no one in the world has ever gotten before. So, um, I, I guess that's that's the part that I'm I'm really like wondering about because when you started commercial diving it was like it wasn't about filmmaking at that point it was just about like i'm gonna dive and this is a way that i can make a living off of it right so at what point were you like oh i can actually combine the two of them yeah so uh, i mean after about eight years of, of of recreationally teaching teaching diving you know working in resorts doing open water courses dive master courses stuff like that i, I started to get kind of bored um, right kind of like kind of burnt out from doing the same thing so i I kept kind of uh, evolving in the diving world. The, the great thing about diving is there's so many different avenues you can go down. You know, it's it's not just uh, you know one type of diving. Right. There's, there's cold water. There's warm water. There's caves. There's ice. There's rebreathers. There's free diving. It's just like there's so many different disciplines of diving that that's what really kind of sucked me in. And so I I was experimenting with all the different disciplines and went into technical diving and started diving deeper with multiple tanks and for longer. And then I, I realized that, you know, I, 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 I want to make more of a living. Like I was kind of like, yeah, being able to support myself and go country to country, but I was never going to be able to buy a home or a vehicle or something like that. So I, I went into the route of commercial diving because I, I, I saw it as a, a means to financially support myself and to be able to actually buy proper cameras. Um, when I was traveling, I was learning to shoot on the fly, just, you know, picking up like little compact cameras. And when GoPro came out, I <laughs> had the GoPro 1, the GoPro 2, GoPro 3, and just started, you know, trying to get better and better and create unique stuff because I was in these, these incredible locations all throughout the world. And it was kind of fun to send, you know, photos back to my, my friends back home. It was kind of cool when I, when I started. There was no Instagram. There was no Facebook. It was just like, you know, you go to a little internet cafe in a uh, in this tropical island to, to send a, send a couple uh, photos by like Hotmail or, or something like that. They like compress them down. They're like pixelated. And yeah, exactly. Really janky. So I, I I went the commercial diving route with my thought of you know possibly going offshore, like working on oil rigs, doing like six months of uh, work, and then coming back home and, and doing like six months of my hobbies like like filming and, and trying to get better at that but i um yeah i went went to commercial school and i ended up just right after the course i, I started getting contracts all, all around canada uh, doing marine construction sh ship husbandry 
uh, potable re water reservoir cleaning, environmental surveys. Um, and I was kind of enthralled because in commercial, there's, again, there's like a thousand different anim avenues that you can go down. Like, right. are you underwater welding or are you, you know, operating a big dredge and sucking up mud from a, a lake or something like that? So I, <laughs> I, I was excited. You know, I, I wanted to go and salvage shipwrecks. I thought that was so cool. I thought that was like, you know, such a badass thing to, to do. You know, I've done it multiple times now. I don't, <laughs> I'm kind of over it because it's just, it's just work now. It's, uh, but I'm, right. really, I'm really glad I did all these kind of different diving contracts because it just ultimately made me um, a better diver and, and just more knowledgeable of, of, of different disciplines of diving, whether it's, you know, rigging or, uh, or, or anything like that. And that kind of all tied into uh, film work because in film, in film, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, times where you, you're gonna have to set up like a scene. You have to you have to rig underwater. You yeah. got big cameras, lights, and, and it, it all kind of ties in with one another. And it's uh, yeah, it worked out really well. The commercial route allowed me to buy the cameras I needed in the house, and yeah, I just I just kind of chipped away whenever I had spare time. Going out to to film, take pictures, and started using Instagram. I was really late to the scene. Like I, I think I only got on Instagram like like four four or five years ago. Right. And I just started, started late than never. <laughs> started putting stuff on there, and I started to get like noticed by by production companies, and I would sell stock footage to the BBC and, and, and different shows, um, just because I was, I, I was getting some pretty cool, unique stuff in the in the cold water environments uh, around Vancouver Island. And, and then I just kind of, you know, kept, kept chipping away at it. And it, it wasn't until uh, I took the time with my business partner, Russell Clark to, to, to put a film together. Um, it was just kind of a passion project. And that was Temple's The Big Little Migration. And uh, yeah, we, we, we made that uh, with kind of zero expectations. We thought, you know, maybe, maybe a thousand people will see it and think it's kind of cool, but it was, for us, it was a, it's a passion project. Yeah. Um, but it just ended up doing so well. It, 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 it went, yeah. it went viral. Um, you know, teachers were showing it in schools all around North America to try and get the, the students excited about like these freshwater ecosystems and, right. uh, just to make people kind of more aware of, you know, what's, what's in our backyard and, and, what I learned is in, in natural history, like on these, you know, BBC type shows, these type of stories are gold. Like it's, it, I, I struck like a gold mine because no one had ever done tadpoles before. Right. So all of a sudden. I've never seen them. Like, <laughs> I had all these time. productions, like, like as soon as we put it out, like probably like 15 different emails of different productions saying like, oh, we, we'd like to film that. Like, can you show us where that is? Right. Of course, I, I, I said no to the ones that just wanted the information. I, I, I took the ones that were going to let me go there and film it for their their stories <laughs> that's so funny and you got you got a little more than you bargained for it sounded like um and and not just with like with tadpoles but like a lot of your filming it sounded like it was you you were like it was passion project and did you envision yourself like making a full-time living out of it like when you were commercial diving obviously you're like saving up every paycheck to, to go and buy some camera gear and if we fast forward to now like was was that the goal from the beginning or is, is it is it kind of crazy looking back now uh, i mean it was a dream i i didn't know how it would be possible i didn't know the steps of how to get into the, the industry i mean it's a really sought after thing because there's so many people that want to do it but to actually get your foot in the door it's it's not easy it's 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 a, it's it's, it's kind of hard you got to make the right connections and yeah and really learn how to tell tell stories um through through a camera um it's not about just capturing a moment it's capturing a whole sequence and, and showing you know different animal behavior or predation moments and, and things like that and it's it's quite quite challenging which you know I, I really love i love it that's that's super fantastic time for we'll switch gears here time for a little game um, okay so a day in the life. Well, it's not really a game, but it's a, a day in the life of uh, under underwater edition with your boy Maxwell. This is where we get a chance to put ourselves in your flippers um, and get the inside scoop on what we've always wanted to know or ask uh, of a diver. So we'll, we'll kind of we'll end with bodies of water, but we'll start with underwater animals. So I'd love to understand like what it's like to hang out, kind of rapid fire. Um, sea lions. What's it? What, what's it like hanging out with sea lions? Oh man, sea lions are—they're so much fun. They're—they're they're like big underwater puppies. 
they they're so inquisitive they're 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 curious and they they use their mouths to feel um so a lot of people kind of get nervous because you know they're they're feeling a diver's head with their giant mouths and they've got the same bone structure as a grizzly bear so it's it's a little bit intimidating but you know once you you, you learn that these, these animals they're not out to get you they're just you know sea lions they're they're just they're they're round um and they're just you know very very like playful and fun and it's yeah they're, they're great i love them <laughs> i love the the selfie that you have with uh that's a sea lion right like yeah. with you and it's just hanging out behind you looking straight at the camera too <laughs> yeah they're, they're amazing um what about salmon what's it like hanging out with salmon yes yeah, salmon are amazing and this is actually the the perfect time of year uh in august to to to, to dive with them uh, right the salmon are coming up the rivers uh right now by the thousands like uh in, in campbell river there's there's probably a hundred thousand pinks uh in the, in the river system right now so to be in with them it's 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 quite cool because you just have like this, this tornado of, of fish and you're in the middle of it and they're just kind of schooling and swimming around you as they they work their way up the river to spawn are they super skittish and they get scared or can you get kind of close to them if they're in large numbers yeah i mean the, the salmon of course they're, they're very scared because uh one of their main predators in the river is bears. So when you're all dressed in black, you kind of look somewhat like a bear. Yeah. Um, but I found, you know, trying to be calm and still and, and kind of wait one spot for, for kind of hours on end, they eventually warm up to you and they, they come and swim right up to your face. And that's that's still such a cool experience, though. What's it like hanging out with orca whales underwater? What are they like? Orcas are they're amazing. They're, you know, just such... Uh, beautiful animals. They, they don't. They're not really interested in people, though. The the only th- I've only been in the water a couple times with them, and it wasn't like an intended like you know jump in to find the orcas. I was I was working, and they're swimming by me. I was like, whoa, like that's crazy. Um, and they just kind of swam up, right? Looked, looked at me, and you can just tell like they're they're really intelligent animals. Like they're they they know what's going on. They 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 know you know that you're not uh, a seal like you're not part of their diet and, uh, <laughs> thankfully and yeah i mean they're, they're they're i'd love to do some some filming opportunities with them like maybe go to, to norway or somewhere like that where you're, you're allowed to get in the water with them i think that would be really cool that reminds me have you heard of that sea i think it's a sea lion in norway that is just way too friendly and it just like it jumps up on people's boats and it jumps up on shore and it just kind of hangs out and people try to get rid of it. It, it. It's like, and they're they're threatening to like take it away and like remove it. I, I, was that the walrus or? Or that? yeah, it's it's a walrus. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a walrus. It's like, what's her name? Like Freda or something like Freya. that. Freya. 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 Yeah. That's oh my goodness. That okay. Going and documenting the life of Freya actually might be a really cool thing to do. I mean, she's already traveled around a whole bunch, but yeah. I want, who who knows where she'll go next, though. <laughs> yeah, you know, funny you talk about walrus. I, I just got home from the Arctic not too long ago, right? And my subject to film was walrus. Oh, really? Yeah, walrus. Like, uh, there's not. I don't think there's been very many people in the world that have actually, you know, fully filmed them. Um, and I was before I had the assignment. I, I was reaching out to, to other you know camera operators in the world, um, those that are, you know specialize in cold water and have been in the Arctic before. Yeah. And I asked them like you know, uh, I just got this assignment to film walrus. Like, do you have any advice for me? What do you think? Right. And every one of them was like, don't do it. They're like the, the most intimidating and scary animals in the world to be in the water with. Really. And I was like, oh no, like. This is, that's 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 not that's not what I wanted to hear. That's not what I wanted to hear. And of course, I had already said yes to the assignment, and I I still really wanted to do it. And you know, with proper planning, I think you know you can kind of achieve anything. So yeah, we we, we went ahead and we went up to the Arctic and we found walrus and we just spent time like looking for for ones that were calm, ones that were relax, relaxed, and ones right. that you know we didn't feel threatened by, and we had you know proper safety procedures in place and. We ended up finding like a, a few that were very cooperative, and yeah, I mean these 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 animals are like forty five hundred pounds. Their their tusks are like twenty four inches long. It's they they're massive oh animals, God. and to see them underwater with their, their tusks just like kind of glow in the in the sunlight, and they're swimming towards yeah, it's 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 a bit scary. I can't wait for the 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 series to come out, but um, 
yeah, had walrus and and I got to dive with a polar bear as well. Which no is way, pretty they're, crazy. They're just kind of in there, like yeah, like bear, like doggy paddling around. Exactly. They 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 swim around with their their front two <laughs> front two hands and uh, and their 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 back legs just kind of like drag in behind them and they they swim out like hundreds of kilometers to try and predate on these walrus. Of course, they're Whoa. They're, they're looking for like the smaller ones, the 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 pups. Uh, but yeah, it's crazy. These polar bears just swim like hundreds of kilometers these little ice um, uh, flows, and they you know look for seals and walrus and things like that. So we, when we were out there looking for walrus, we we, we found a, a, a polar bear that was trying to predate and hunt the walrus. So we kind of you know gave it some distance and waited quite a while and just kind of watched what it was doing, and then eventually got kind of upstream of it, jumped in the water so that as it was swimming upstream, I could kind of, kind of film from below as it goes over top of me. And we got some, yeah, some pretty cool stuff. Holy smokes. <laughs> oh, that's, that sounds insane. Like, yeah, if diving wasn't scary enough on its own, like <laughs> being part of an active, like hunt, like chase scene like that. Yeah. But man, that must be so insane though. It's so cool. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I have to say those are probably the two, marine or two things in the water that are just out of this world they're crazy like i i want to go back and do it some more because it's it's absolutely phenomenal yeah it doesn't sound like this will be your last time doing it luckily so (laughs) just just getting started let's talk about bodies of liquid just for a second i was trying to think of the right term like but they're not bodies of water because some of them most of them are not water but um i'd love to start with things that you've dove inside of so um we'll start easy golf ponds have you done like golf ball retrieval before uh never golf ball retrieval but a lot of like similar kind of <laughs> swampy environments that i have been in okay um what how about water towers i've heard that's a thing that people do yep yeah, yeah my, in my commercial diving days I, I did a lot of like potable water reservoirs and so some of these are like 150 200 feet towers and you gotta you gotta climb up there tow all the all the all the gear you know your tanks and your your surf supply helmet uh stuff like that like hoist it up into the the tower set up a little state it's usually like a, a full full day of just prep for the site and then uh then you dive the next day but yeah then you get in with the big big dredge and and vacuum out the the bottom sediment. Wow, it's, it's kind of a regulation with all the water towers that every seven years they have to be cleaned out. And instead of you know draining these million gallon uh, reservoirs, they just they just send a diver in with a big vacuum cleaner to, to suck it suck out the sediment. <laughs> sounds a lot easier. Sounds a lot more practical. That's right. They don't. I don't know where they would put the water if they weren't. They, that's what the reservoir was built for. Um, what about uh, getting a little more eccentric now? Have you done like? I was thinking like distilleries, breweries, or something like like a wine, like a gigantic vat of wine. Any alcohol stuff? I I, I wish. I think that would be pretty cool to, <laughs> yeah. to say like, oh yeah, I, I dove in a in a thing of beer. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I I haven't done any kind of distilleries or anything like that. But that would be that would be on my bucket list. Uh, you already know what's coming, but vats full of cheese. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been in a lot of weird substrates, um, like mud, uh, human effluent, uh, real, real gnarly stuff, uh, cheese. Uh, yeah, I mean, th- th- a lot of times, instead of emptying these, these, uh, these containers or these storage places for this, this substance, it's a much often easier to get um, a diver in a hazmat suit or some kind of like, you know, suit that's dedicated for the job get them in and uh to fix whatever problems needed so you, you get really good at uh using your, your 10 eyes so using your fingers to, to see underwater um just kind of feeling around and uh and then and then fixing fixing the pipe or uh you know whatever whatever the mission can be you're you're you're, you're given the task to do in the dark what's what's the craziest one that that so cheese sounds like one of the more insane ones in like sewage you've done before um, yeah. Any other ones that I, that we didn't like cover on on my list? Like I can't even imagine some of them. Yeah, I, I mean, I've I've been in these substrates where it's 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 like jello. So you get in, wow, and, and you can't you can't move. Like you try to swim, you try to like walk on the bottom, and you're just suspended because it's it's so thick. So quite often when you're diving in these kind of um, uh, or this kind of substance, 
you'll have a umbilical. So umbilical is the top side for for having like your your air. Um, so top side is always going to have a uh, unlimited amount of air for you to, to achieve your task. Um, but then you to kind of get through it, you need to have a rope tied to your front. So you've got the umbilical coming off your back, the rope on your front, and they literally like you're you're like a piece of dental floss. They'll they'll, they'll pull you through this this jello substrate oh until you find you know whatever pipe you have to work on, or you might be just measuring a distance of how thick this this, this substrate is, and so they're just dragging you through like a like a like a like a, something on a string uh, as dental floss going going through this 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 jello substance, and and really like. It's it's quite scary because when you when you exhale, your bubbles like struggle to, to get up to the surface. So it's like oh. they're like finding a way to get get through the jealous substance. You can like watch them and they'll like try a direction, maybe try another direction. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, it'd, be, it'd be cool to see, but quite often the, I've, it's just complete black. You don't see anything. Yeah, um, to go where no human has gone before. Yeah, I don't really you know prefer to do that stuff anymore. I'm glad I I did it. I tried it. Uh, I made some money doing it, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna put that that stuff in the past for now. Um, switching gears here, uh, really, this will super rapid fire. Um, so these are just like yes nos. Okay. Um, time for a game called "Did You Dabble with It?" So I've got some subjects, topics, and pastimes. Uh, some of them have some truth to them, and some of them are a complete shot in the dark. We don't really know. So I'll say the subject, and then you just tell us if you did indeed dabble with it. Let's get started. Um, saying let's dive in at the beginning of a meeting or a presentation. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> 100%. Um, I think I said at the beginning of the podcast, um, Legos. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the Rolex Submariner. No. Mm. Any any diving watch at all? No. no. No diving watches? Well, I guess like uh, Suto. Okay. Yeah. I don't have a pilot watch. I need to obviously <laughs> fix that. Um, Breitling, I, I would love to get in contact with your team to talk about something that we could do here. So um, getting injured, trying to do crazy tricks or get some air on a trampoline. Yes. Really? Hazmat suits. Yep. Uh, are you in a shark week? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 50, 50. Fi- a, a little bit here and there. Yeah. Dabbles a bit with the sharks. Um, failing a swimming lesson when you were a kid. No, no way. <laughs> Um, artisan hot sauces. Oh yeah, yeah. Big hot sauce guy. Um, correcting somebody on the plural of octopodes. <laughs> uh, I haven't, but I might. <laughs> there's there's three different types of uh, words that you can use for that apparently. Um, gyrocopters. Oh yeah. Not a lot of people have been in gyrocopters, so that's uh. Yeah, pretty. I, I, I'm jealous. It's scary. Uh, <laughs> scary. Uh, horse racing. Uh, yes, I have. I have. No, a little bit in the yeah. horse races. Um, Star Wars. Oh yeah, big fan. Um, vintage dive gear. Oh yeah. Yep. Do you have one of those like helmets, like the classic, like I don't like, like great like helmet thing? Yeah. So, so the classic one is the Mark V, and that's the one that everyone, you know, likes to collect, and I'm, I'm trying to find one so if you see one let me know i will definitely do that um bird watching no i'm not really into birds I don't, I've, I've had assignments to film them but yeah <laughs> they don't do it for me fair enough um ice fishing uh no i'm not much of a fisherman yeah i mean it makes sense you're trying to film them you're not trying to take them out of the ocean right <laughs> well thanks for playing did you dabble with it we've got a sunset here so we're, i mean we probably put a we should have put sunsets on the dabble list here because we're dabbling with it super hard right now oh man i'm dabbling hard with this sunset this is amazing talk me through like some of the challenges of filming underwater obviously there's the technical components to it as well but what what other challenges do, are we not seeing there oh man it, like with anything to do with being in the water uh as a extra level of complication um, you need special housing. So you, you know, one little droplet of water in your housing yeah. can ruin your whole dive. Uh, you know, you, you got to be really meticulous with the equipment, um, but also like being really, really comfortable underwater. There's a lot of people that want to film underwater, but aren't necessarily like that experienced diving. But I feel like you got to master, you got to master diving uh, before you can, you know, bring a camera down. It's like 
uh, you know, becoming a pilot, you wouldn't be filming in a plane right away. You no. Know, you got to put, put the months of, of flying in and, and before you even brought a camera kind of thing. So same, same thing with diving. You know, you got to put that, that time in and, and, and master the your buoyancy because when you watch underwater footage, it's all, you know, you want nice and smooth shots. And in order to achieve that, you really have to be a master of, of, of buoyancy in the water and being able to control yourself and going, um, you know, certain speeds or, or being able to rotate or, or go along the bottom without kicking up the sediment and completely destroying the, the visibility. So it's just one of those things that takes a lot of time and, and practice, really. If you could magically make one thing easier about creating films underwater, what would that be? <laughs> oh, I just wish it, it, I wish the stuff weighed a little bit less. I, I put all of my gear together of what I take in the water, and that's like, you know, my big red camera, my rebreather, my weights, my dry suit, my fins. And I've got, you know, about 250 pounds of gear that I've got to, I've got to get into the water. Of course, once you get in the water, you're, you're, you're okay because it's everything's set to be neutrally buoyant and you can float. But sometimes you have to walk to get to a certain site, and, uh, you know, you're, you're hauling all of this gear, walking through a forest trail. It could be in the summer, so it's like 30 degrees, and you're just roasting. But of course, you, you don't want to have too little thermals because once you get in the water, you're going to be freezing. So it's just, yeah, if the stuff could be lighter, I would be much appreciated. <laughs> Until they figure that out, I don't, I don't know. Are you listening, Red Cameras? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Well, Maxwell, it's the moment that we've all been waiting for. All so right. um, we've got two control columns for a reason. You know, mine's connected to yours. So, um, I'm always going to be able to step in if we need to, but um, yeah. Are you ready to fly a little bit? I'm ready. Okay, let's do it. Okay. So you're in control, and you see the gap closed right there, right? Okay. So that means that we're going to go up. Um, and you can go ahead and just, just push and just get a feel for it. So like, that's the sensitivity level. Obviously, you get more distance there, and yeah. then it means we're going to go down. So that controls the elevator in the back. Yeah, yeah. then you got the turning, right? So... Give it a little rock in both directions, and then we'll. What we'll do next is we'll do a turn, and we can go and like turn by the sun. Is that more or less sensitive than you thought it was going to be? Um, uh, <laughs> more, I think. More sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. You don't get seasick, or you, I don't. I doubt it if you're diving, but. No, no. Fortunately, I, I don't. <laughs> Luckily, yeah, that's yeah. good. The last few seconds of the sunset are pretty insane because it's just like. You can you can see it in real time, just like disappear. Yeah. Well, that's it. We are getting close to our final destination, and the seatbelt sign has been turned on for landing. Um, Maxwell, we'll turn the spotlight over to you for one quick moment to take us home, okay. uh, and you can keep flying. Tell the world anything that you want to tell them, and of course, let us know how to find you. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, uh, my direct website. It's just all. Maxwell Hone. Um, yeah, I, I'm really excited for these these series to come out that I've been working on. Um, there's one that's going to be coming out hopefully, um, I think I think September or October, and it's all about wildlife on Vancouver Island. Wow! So so keep keep your eyes out for that. Um, I'm really proud to have worked on that because I, I, I mean I got to do about a dozen different shoots all all throughout some of the most incredible spots on Vancouver Island. So, so that will be coming out soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Maxwell is referring to none other than Island of the Sea Wolves on Netflix, which as of a couple months ago has won four Emmy Awards. Sorry it took so long to edit this, Maxwell, and congratulations to you and your whole team on such an incredible achievement. Very well deserved. And there's a, yeah, there's a bunch more. Um, of course, I've signed NDA, so I'm not supposed to talk about any of them, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, they'll, they'll be coming out, and I'll, I'll definitely post them on my, my social media platforms as well for, for links to, to get to them. You heard it here first, guys. Stay tuned for more. Lots more from Maxwell Hone. Thanks so much for coming up to 9,000 feet with us today. I know you're normally down like a few hundred feet, but today we're, we're going up. So um, it was amazing to have you on the, on, the, on the talk show. Thanks so much for coming on Radio Chatter. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been a, like a dream come true. I'm flying a plane. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. You know exactly what to do. Fasten your seatbelts and subscribe for more.